did it. Yes, sir. At the time, it would probably fall off. Uh, the other day, I was sitting around my house just inventorying my chins, you know, which I do, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. When I got a call from uh, Jimmy Beller saying, hey, you could move up your parents. And I said, sure, I'm retired. Uh, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, virtually the history of the world. You know, uh, talk about yourself, your own experiences, your time in the military and in Vietnam. Talk about World War II. Talk about the fight at Reifersville. Talk about your collecting. And, uh, you know, get it all done in 45 minutes or so. Uh, well, i got to tell you that normally I'm not asked to talk about myself. Normally it's the other way around where they say, shut up, we're tired of hearing you, sit down. Uh, so this is not a prepared uh, lecture or coverage. I've put some slides together. I'll ramble on uh, in the <coughs> form that I found for myself to be most comfortable when I was sitting in audiences. Uh, as soon as I arrived in Germany, I was sent down to southern Germany. I was in Berlin. <coughs> to attend what they call the commander's course. And this was to teach me how to be a company commander after I'd already been a company commander twice before. Um, and one of, the, one of the course sections was called Notes from the First Sergeant. And that was the most fascinating class I think I've ever attended. There was a fellow there who was a sergeant major who had been either a sergeant major or a first sergeant for about 25 years. And he just talked off the cuff about his experiences on various things that we might face and various things that therefore should go through our minds. And the one thing that he taught me that I learned was absolutely true was that when one of your NCOs tells you, we got it covered, find out how and why. Um, they had a thief in his unit. He told his people, when you find him, and you will, you can have him for 20 minutes. <coughs> then I want him. Everybody understand that? Yeah. So a couple hours later, he walked out on the front porch of the orderly room and looked down the street. Here's this guy hanging from a lister bag support. And they were timing him for 20 minutes. <laughs> so, he learned to modify his instructions to people. <laughs> and also to follow up on it. Uh, and it stood me in good stead. So I figured I'd, I'll do the same sort of thing here, and I'll just talk uh, about things that I've experienced uh, and things that have been related to me. I had 25 years in the Army. Uh, I can't say I enjoyed them all, but I certainly learned from it all. And I left because it was time for me to go. Uh, I had, had as much fun as I could deal with. Now, if I turn on my projector here. Can we dim the lights a little bit? Yeah. Just shoot them out. Is that clear to everyone? You can, yeah, you can read it. Excellent. I like it here. I, I joined the Army in uh, 1966 after I was physically removed from the, company, to the country of Korea because of a number of criminal activities in which I was engaged in as a dependent. Uh, and rather than just put me in prison, they moved me out. And I got to tell you, as a teenager, I was a hoodlum. Uh, I wasn't a very good one, but I was a hoodlum. The Army is what calmed me down, very much like a gelding gets calmed down. Um, so I, I enlisted in the Army in, in San Diego, California, the same day that I got drafted. So I was drafted and enlisted. And I got my draft notice first forwarded to me by my grandfather, who lived in Brooklyn, which is where my draft board was. I was in San Diego. And I still have it. On top of it is a subway token taped to it for me to get down to Whitehall Station from uh, San Diego, California. But I didn't want to get drafted. I wanted to choose the branch I was going into. So I pretended I'd not received that letter, and I went down to the recruiting sergeant that day and said, hey, sign me up. This was in the height of the Vietnam War, and they weren't 
you used to see people walk in their offices and say, sign me up. So this guy was pretty happy. And I took a battery of tests, and uh, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, my dad is my hero. And my dad's hero was the World War II infantrymen. He told me about them, about seeing them during the war. And that's what I want to do. I want to be an infantryman. And this recruiting sergeant says, you're out of your mind. Uh, how about we make you a truck driver or a clerk? So I said, no, 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 no. Sign me up. I want to be an infantryman. So I was. And I went through basic training at Fort Ord, California, and AIT, Advanced Individual Training at Fort Ord, California. And I stayed on there uh, to help train other troops for a while. And then I went to Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. And our, our CO, as shown here, was Mel R. Godby. And his motto was, cleanliness is next to godliness. And he was an absolute nut about that stuff. How I got through OCS, I have no idea. I was born at West Point. The Army and I both knew that it would be foolish to send me to West Point. This is the area in, in between a couple of the company buildings uh, in OCS. And this is a picture of a neighboring platoon of mine holding a room inspection outdoors. The attack officer established that this street here was going to be the central hallway. And they were lining up all their wall lockers and their desks and their lockers and their chairs in precise order and distance from imaginary walls and imaginary halls and this sort of thing. The rest of us sat there and laughed at them, of course, but we didn't have to put up with it. This is what happens after they inspected our rooms. You can see they look pretty nice. Uh, one of the interesting things the tactical officers did to make us feel more love for them uh, was they would invite the wives in for a coffee while we were out of training. Um, and we had to hand wax our floors. They were uh, square tile floors, black floors. We had to hand wax them and then we put glow coat on them. So they shined like the dickens and then we wouldn't walk on them except in our stocking feet and then only very widely spaced apart tiles. And then we could just clean those one or two. So the tax would bring all these ladies in for tea. And of course, they're all wearing high heels. And that's exactly what the tax wanted. And he'd walk them all over the company and show them all our rooms and everything. And everything would be just destroyed. And that's me in OCS. I, I kept this picture because I was 6'1". I think I'm somewhat shorter now. But as a consequence, I always got the heavy stuff to carry. I either carried a 90 millimeter Republic rifle, or in this case a radio, uh, or some other delightful piece of equipment that needed somebody to lug it. And that is a 4.2 inch mortar. It's bigger than the howitzers that supported this in terms of caliber, and just about as heavy. And you'll notice that there's a base plate here that weighs, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds. 200. 200, okay. Well, that thing, that particular mortar, was dropped on my left foot as we were trying to get it out of the truck against a time uh, thing. And my, my big toe was uh, severely caved in, as was my, my, uh, uh, my boot. But you got to toughen on. I certainly didn't want to get recycled, so we just pretended it didn't happen. And I moved on. This coming Friday, the Veterans Administration is going to remove that toenail permanently. <laughs> all, all because of that so. and we did river crossing and this is one of the few things in OCS that stood us in good stead in Vietnam because we crossed a lot of rivers and this taught us how to do it with ropes, pulleys, air mattresses whatever you can find <coughs> my first tour in Vietnam was with the 199th Infantry Brigade this is the shoulder patch of it here it was a separate outfit was not assigned to a division and we operated in the Three Corps area, which was um, down around the Saigon area, although not specifically in Saigon. But this was the first part of what I saw when I got there, and I thought to myself as we pulled up, holy cat, I'd like to be the guard in that tower with the big sign saying, just shoot right here, because this was on a perimeter. And we went back there and trained for a couple of weeks, and then we went out to the field for a couple of weeks, built our little 
rear area. And by the way, we saw that rear area twice in the year that I was there. Each company had a, a little tent and a bomb shelter in between the tents. And then we went in the jungle. And there are about three soldiers in that picture. And I give you an idea of how confined it was up in, in War Zone D. You could see about 10 or 15 feet. Um, you could smell a bit longer than that, especially guys who were not smokers, and especially the enemy, who had very good senses of smell. And we, we pretty much had a body odor and a, and a smoking odor and everything that wafted throughout the jungle. This is a guy named Prescott. Now, this was back in the olden days in the Army. And Prescott was one of two guys in my platoon who were given the option of going in the Army or going to prison. Uh, he and my other machine gunner, Sam Hill, were both from Chicago. And they were from Chicago in every sense of that word. And so I give them each a machine gun and let them work out their anxieties. Prescott is a guy that deafened my left ear by resting his machine gun on my shoulder one day and using me for a bipod as he opened up and sprayed the trees. And we got our own water. And this is a, about a 750 pound bomb crater out in the middle of War Zone D. And uh, we were a whole new unit, so nobody knew what to do. We didn't know where we were going to get food and rations. We didn't know what we were doing. We just went out there and stumbled around. Some guys were even carrying a pair of clothing. Uh, and we quickly learned that that was not the wise idea. And after about three weeks of this sort of thing, the Army said, holy cow, these guys all came over at once, so they're all going home at once. We can't have that. So this unit that had trained together in the States for seven months, and I might add, trained at Fort Lewis, Washington, in November through April for Vietnam, in the snow and all that sort of thing. Um, we were, we had people sent away and other people come in, so they just ruined any of the cohesion that we had in the unit. Uh, that's very difficult to see, but it's a pile of M16 rifles and ponchos of the equipment for the, the dead guys from our first major engagement with the enemy that we collected up and shipped out the next day. Now, i got to tell you, <clears throat> I suffer from PTSD, but I didn't believe in PTSD until it struck me down about a year, two years ago. This was one of the reasons. When I went over there, I was a second lieutenant platoon leader. And our first combat operation, the first guy to be killed was one of my soldiers, a guy named David Doris, who was walking flying, who was shot in the back of the head. So the first dead guy I ever saw, I saw at this distance, as I crawled under a poncho, with his body to assure myself that he was dead and to assure myself that he was my guy. So the first dead guy I ever saw was a guy who was killed doing something I told him to do. And I was looking at his blood-covered face that was also covered with ants. And that was my introduction to serious stuff. And later that same night, I watched a machine gun tracer go through another man and kill him. My company commander and both his radio operators were taken out by a single burst of machine gun fire, and I became the company commander just that fast. And there was no time to mourn anybody or think about anything. It was get on with it. And so I began stuff, stuffing things back in my mind. And I wasn't smart enough to know that you got to get them out of your mind somehow. And I didn't learn that until about three or four years ago. We've also been around a number of ammunition dump fires and explosions. This is the main ammunition dump at Long Den, uh, blowing up. The uh, BC got some sappers in there uh, one night and apparently set some time charges because they didn't go off until daylight. And we got to sit here. That distance is probably four or five miles away. And we got to sit here and watch, I don't know how many millions of dollars in uh, tax money. Well, it's only tax money, not like it's real money. So it didn't bother us so much. This is Saigon, and this area, let's see my little pointer works here. I'm really high tech now. This area here is called Camp Davies, and it was an army depot right on the, the Saigon River, basically in downtown Saigon. And they got pretty well hammered during Tet of 68. Uh, and so when things calmed down, my company got sent down there 
to teach them how to defend themselves. And uh, they treated us like kings. You know, they gave us one of those Quonset huts for the company. They brought in mobile fans. They had bunks. They had hot chow. It was fantastic. We didn't like going out on patrols anymore after that. Uh, but then they brought some Everglade fan boats up and ruined everything because that was going to go to work. And we patrolled up and down the river. And you've seen these Everglade fan boats, big airplane engine in the back. You can hear it coming from the next country, cruising up and down the river and those things. I want to show also that the country we were in at this time, which was south of Saigon, was very flat and very wet. And everywhere you went, you were wading in something. Sometimes it was something you didn't want to know what it was. You can see the, the streams here. And quite often we'd follow a compass admin and we'd have to cross the same stream four or five times in a single day. And it wasn't until I was leaving the country that I happened up next to a, a Navy uh, landing craft parked on one of the canals. And this guy had an alligator about that long in the, the well. And I said, where'd you get that? He said, right there. And I'm really glad that for the whole year prior to that, I didn't know they even had alligators. <coughs> this is typical rice paddy dike, and you can see how it limits the terrain. You can't walk in here because it's about this deep in mud. And you can take about five or six steps and you're totally exhausted and, and usually mired in. So you're restricted to walking on the dikes. And the bad guys knew that. I said, that's where they put their booby traps. That's where they zeroed their weapons. And we would have to just get on these dikes and go clear this tree line as an example. And you just walk down there and hope that there weren't anybody in there to shoot at you. Sometimes there was. And then the bad guys had the uh, advantage of being dug in in a tree line while we're out there floundering around in the water. Water buffaloes. Meanest critters on the face of the earth unless you're a Vietnamese kid. Those things would charge GIs, we'd have to shoot them because they were mean and vicious. And a little Vietnamese kid to get out there and punch him in the nose, jump up on his shoulder and ride him like a horse. <coughs> There's some movement along the rice paddy dikes. And there's some mud. Now you notice this guy's being helped out by a gas mask bag. You know, we carried gas mask bags for a while. After our first, the first time we used gas against the enemy, we didn't have any gas masks. And it didn't work too well. Uh, but what happened also was a lot of people would reach out with their weapons say, here, grab my weapon, and bang. And we had a number of guys in the brigade killed that way. Uh, and so it, it, this is why they're doing it with the gas mask bag at this point. And that, you can see how deep the mud is. And it reeks to high heaven because you know what they fertilize it with. And in many cases, the bad guys would sink supplies in that mud. And so in some cases, you had to go out there and probe for it whatever you were hoping to find. This is one of our platoon leaders. Uh, I, I got this one to show you, the gas mask, the radio speaker, which all our RPOs carried so that you could actually hear during the gunfight what was going on on the radio. <coughs> And this was across the river from us. It was an oil refinery called Na Bay. And uh, the Viet Cong announced that they were going to blow it up. And so the Vietnamese army went down there and guarded it. And then the Vietnamese blew it up. And it burned for four or five days. And we could, we could guide on that in the daytime. We didn't have this uh, satellite stuff we got today. We had to use compasses. But those days, all you had to do was look for that big plume of smoke for four or five days. This is a, a booby trap. It's one of the ones that I picked up. It's set with this part buried in the ground and a very simple wire to a pin. And the handle on it was, was painted red. But despite that, they were very difficult to see. This was working with those uh, 
swift boats, or I'm sorry, not swift boats, the uh, river boats. Uh, Navy landing craft, for the most part, they take us out in the river, put us ashore, let us flounder around for a while, and uh, pick us back up. And what's, what's happening here is we're coming back in from patrol, and guys are being issued water. And I should also mention that <clears throat> one time we were blowing down the river in four or five of these boats, and they, they got a front door that drops down just like Normandy Beach. And we took some fire from the bank of the river, and the, the Navy's drill was either put on the gas and go through it, or turn into it and attack. And they chose to turn into it and attack. So these five boats turned, slammed into the shore, dropped those ramps, and we got off, we couldn't find anything. And we said, well, we weren't dreaming. There were people shooting at us, but there's no evidence here. When they picked the ramps up, there were three bad guys laying underneath one of those ramps. It was like a giant fly swatter. So they painted those little figures on the side of their conning tower of the, the ship. That's just one of the gunboats uh, cruising up and down the river. It's one of the few times we got cool because you're moving on the river and you got the, the breeze to help you out. One of my wonderful experiences was standing underneath this area here. This is a armor plate that folds up, folds down. I was standing there talking to a friend and then I woke up. They had dropped the armor plate. They said it's too hot in here. So they just kicked it open. And as I say, I was 6'1". I was wearing a helmet. And that thing was about 5'9", I guess. And uh, drove the helmet down on my head, drove me down on the deck. Uh, so I have been knocked. And you can see they put up a pretty good weight. We had a guy blown overboard by a river ambush. They shot a rocket propelled grenade into the side here. And he was up in this position with a machine gun. And the blast blew him over the side and into the water. And he grabbed one of these tires. Sailing down the river at good speed like that, he's holding on with one tire. Pulls out his pistol, because every machine gunner had a pistol. And he's pounding away with his pistol at the shore as we cruised on down there. We thought that, that was a lot of chutzpah on that guy. <laughs> and this was my, my second platoon sergeant, uh, Joe G. Rush in the back seat. I have this picture for two reasons. One is the name of the Jeep, you'll notice, is the Blue New Part Two. My dad at West Point was known as Hugh the Blue New because it rhymed. And so, when he was in World War II, he had his Jeep painted the Blue New. So when I finally got to the exalted position of company executive officer, and I actually got a Jeep, I became a Blue New Part Two. Now, Joe Rush is probably the finest soldier I ever worked with. Joe and I were wounded the same night together. He was the first platoon sergeant, and I was the company executive officer at the time. And they didn't have a platoon leader, and Joe Rush had gone home on emergency leave because his father had died. So I was told to go out there, take over the first platoon for a short period of time. So I did. And in the first four or five days, we had about 15 guys wounded. Fortunately, nobody killed. So when Joe came back, the remnants of his platoon were about nine or 10 guys. And he let me have a little tongue lashing. And I kept waiting for a delegation from the platoon to come up and say, can you stop being our platoon leader? Because we're not having a good time. But that night was the only night in Vietnam I can recall being sick. And I was just generally sick. And I laid down on a rice paddy dike and I said, Joe, you put the people in because I can't do it. And I went to slide. It was on a little air mattress because I was the XO. I had the only air mattress in the company. Blew it up. was laying down like this. Something woke me up. What it turned to be turned out to be was well, one of the squad leaders, Sergeant Pruitt, yelling incoming. He'd heard mortars firing in the distance. And I opened my eyes just in time for an 81 millimeter mortar to land about that far away from me, but it was in the water. And the water is what saved my life because it retained most of the fragments. And I got sprayed with some small stuff. And it punctured my air mattress, which really chapped me. <laughs> and using only my fingers, 
I dived forward six feet and into this foxhole that, that Joe and the other guys had dug along the side of the dike. And I beat them into it, and they were both sitting with their feet, sitting on the dike with their feet into the hole. Uh, but it was full of water. And then they came in, and I was down at the bottom of all that. And I thought, well, fine. They're just going to kill me. They finally dragged me up. Mortar fire continued to go. Uh, we were looking around sort of perplexed. It was very dark. I'm counting people, and I couldn't find our medic, a guy named Gibson. Elmer G. Gibson, Egg. He was from Kentucky, and uh, he was not the sharpest crayon in the box. <laughs> Elmer, uh, when we got off the boats to go on his operation, every guy was given a, a mortar round and was told, don't lose it. And when we set up at night, turned it into the mortar platoon. Because the mortar rounds are about that long, they're kind of heavy. So Elmer shows up at the end of the second day. He's missing for a whole day. And he's got his mortar round, but no rifle. I said, Elmer, where's your rifle? I dropped it in the river. What? He said, yeah, I stumbled. I was either going to drop this mortar round or my rifle. And I remember you guys said, don't lose that mortar round. So that's a rifle. But Elmer was still asleep on top of the uh, dike. And one round went off, and I heard him go, ugh. I thought, OK, he got hit. So Joe and I reached up and pulled him into the hole. And when he did, he came in facing the inside of the perimeter. Joe and I were looking out. What Elmer saw was our own mortars firing back, big plumes of flame coming out of the muscles as they were shooting. And he yelled, there the sons of bitches are grabs Joe's rifle, and he's going to open up. So we had to subdue Elmer. And then I mentioned to him that he was probably wounded. He said, yeah, probably my hand. So we wrapped his hand up. And I then looked out to the middle where our mortars were going great guns. The tide had come in, so it was all underwater. You can see about this much of the mortar tube sticking out of the water. Because every round was driving them, 81 was driving them into the mud. And I saw this guy running across the, the field, and I recognized him by name as a medic, and this stream of tracers came by, and he went down. And I, I thought he was going to drown, but he went down face first and didn't move. So I went out there and got him and said, and Roy, he was fine. I got him up. But when I did, they said, hey, there's another guy. <laughs> so they hosed the area, and I got hit with a machine gun bullet high on the inside of the, of the groin. Now, it scared me more than it hurt me. Uh, but I found out that night you can't see blood with a red lens flashlight. And I was very interested in that immediate vicinity to be, to be sure everything was accounted for. And uh, I knew I was hit, but I couldn't tell how badly. And I, uh, so anyway, you learn something every day when you do that, that sort of jazz. So anyway, that's Joe Rush and the Blue New, part two. And I'm still buddies with Joe. Joe got wounded a second time, because uh, he and I were both hit relatively lightly. He got blasted to smithereens. Uh, he got shot through the chest. He lost a lung. He lost the use of his left, most of the use of his left hand. He lost his eye. And he had his teeth sheared off with fragments. They weren't pulled out or knocked out. They were cut off. And he had exposed nerves in his teeth for about a month or so before they could get everything squared away. And they were <laughs> they were going to discharge him. Joe was back at Walgreen Army Hospital, pretty well messed up. And uh, this little guy from admin came upstairs and said, Sergeant Rush, we've decided we're going to retire you from the Army for medical reasons. And old Joe Rush says, I don't want to be retired. I'm not through being a soldier yet. They said, well, you don't have any choice. We're the guys that have the choice, and you're just a little scumbag sergeant, and we're going to retire you, so get used to it. Have a nice day. See you around. So Joe was pretty much down on his, on his uh, haunches at that point, and he had to go to a, uh, a medical clinic to see about his eye. So he's being pushed in a wheelchair through Walter Reed, and he got in an elevator, and this other guy comes in being pushed in a wheelchair, and he's about as old as Methuselah, and the two of them are side by side but there are pushers behind them. And they're waiting for this elevator to go down. And this old guy starts talking to Joe. He says, 
how come you look so morose? And Joe said, well, they're going to forcibly retire me, and I don't want that. And so the fellow says, oh, really? Says, What's your name? And he says, Joe Rush. This old guy tells his pusher, he says, write that down. Away they go. Two days later, Joe's sitting in his bed. This little twerp from personnel comes up. He says, Sergeant Rush, we've decided not to retire you. Uh, because we're wise and all powerful, and so you're going to get to stay in the army. And it turns out that guy in the elevator was Strom Thurmond. <laughs> so Joe stayed in the army, and he went back to Vietnam. And his mission, his self-imposed mission, was to finagle his way back into an infantry battalion and be the operations sergeant. So he was just trying to be as quiet and as inconspicuous as he could be as they processed him through. And they got him to a replacement detachment, Mignon or someplace. And uh, the company commander was an old shot up guy too. And he had the roster. He said, where's Sergeant Rush? Rush put his hand. He says, Sergeant Rush, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay here and be my first sergeant. And Rush said, oh, no, 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 I'm a soldier. I want to go again. No questions. You're my first sergeant. And in that capacity, first sergeant of a replacement detachment, he got wounded the third time by enemy mortar fire. What a tough old guy, and a fantastic fellow. We also had some of these boats that you could land helicopters on, which was, which was bad because it would bring in people that wanted to supervise you, but it was good because you'd get your wounded guys out. And that was my smoke pole. Some guy sent me these, uh, these little flower hair stick-ons, and this was the era of flower power. So I decided I must put that on there for a little bit. And there's one of those Everglade fan boats. And Joe was driving one of those when he was hit. And if you can imagine the noise of, of those things, and we're going down little canals, and I mean, the enemy knew Tuesday that there was somebody coming Friday. <laughs> this is now my second tour. I came home from Vietnam, was assigned to Fort Dix, and worked basic training. Uh, I had a basic training company and I worked for the uh, uh, Advanced Individual Training Committee group and I got out of there without going to prison, which was the chief important thing. But this is early in my second tour. Um, I was a company commander in this tour for the, the whole of the time. I showed up in the uh, rear area with my little fatigues on and my baseball hat and uh, the colonel flew in and he said, I suppose you want to rifle company. And I said, you bet. He said, okay, you can have B company uh, because the guy who's out there has been held 10 days past his release date from the Army, not just from Vietnam. And I thought, geez, I didn't know you could do that legally. And so Colonel Burkhardt said, understandably, he's ready to leave. Uh, so you're going to go out there. So meet me on the helipad in 20 minutes and we'll go do this. So I found out where B Company's rear area was, had my little suitcase, and I went in and I found a supply guy and said, here's my suitcase, I'm the new CO, I need a, a bomb hat, shooting iron, rucksack, canteens, poncho line, all that stuff. And the guy said, we got none of that. You're going to have to get whatever you get from the outgoing company commander. I said, okay. So the colonel and I flew out to this general area. You can see how tall the grass is hovered down in that field and said, get out. And so I jumped out in the field dressed like I'm going to go to, to work here in the States like a bus driver. And uh, the helicopter stayed there hovering. And finally this guy pokes his head out of the bushes, grimy, dirty, head shaved in one. He said, you a new company commander? I said, yeah. He said, boy, I'm glad to see you here. And he started giving me stuff. And I just held the helmet in front of me and he took off, everything was tied down. They called them dummy cords, so he wouldn't lose them. And he took off his code book and he put it in there and he took off a compass and he threw it in there. He took off a pen gun he had and put it in there and he took off a strobe light and he put the, and I'm getting all this stuff packed into the helmet. And he threw a pistol in there just for good measure, a couple of hand grenades. And he said, rucksack everything back in the, in the woods. Here's a rifle, have a nice day. He got on the helicopter and they left. And I'm standing out in the middle of that field holding his helmet full of stuff all by himself. 
Fortunately, you can follow a trail through the elephant grass. So I followed this trail back into the woodland until I found a couple of guys, and I said, where's the command post? I said, over there. So I went to the command post, I found a radio operator, and I said, whoever the other leaders are, call them over here so I can meet them. And that's when I met the other two platoon leaders who introduced themselves as Plowboy and Kentucky. Everybody went by nicknames. There were no other officers in the company. And uh, I didn't know whether these guys were PFCs or Lieutenant General. Uh, but I just had to assume that they were Plowboy and Kentucky, that they were probably sergeants. And that was my introduction to the company. We went away from there, and I had a, a relatively uneventful uh, seven months in command of the unit. The one thing different about the first tour and this tour was that we carried the enormous rucksacks on the second tour, and we worked on what they call a three-day log. And every third day, they would fly helicopters out with mail and rations and ammunition, and then you'd go for another three days. And if they couldn't get to you, they just kick stuff out. We wanted them to land because sometimes we got cold sodas um, and sometimes hot food. So it was important for us to have a landing zone. And so we tried to chop down trees or whatever we could to make that happen, but it didn't always happen. This is the landing zone that we cut that was, you can see, not very big. The, the rotor blades on a helicopter are 35 feet. And we knew that. And we hoped that, the, since they were first cavalry division pilots, they were probably pretty good. And uh, the bigger their eyes were as they settled down through the jungle, the closer that LZ was, and the more we knew we'd done our job to help them earn their flight pay. Uh, and this was a hover down and hover straight back up through about 60 feet of jungle to get in and out of there. But they brought us ice cream. Every man got a half gallon of strawberry ice cream. And uh, you tried to eat it as fast as you could because it was melting. I got pictures of guys holding that thing and the stuff's running down his elbows. <laughs> each as heavy as you could be. This is one of our fire bases out in the woods. Now this was taken from the upper echelon where the infantry guys and the battalion headquarters was looking down across this brow where they had the artillery. There's a cannon in there. There's another one over in there. Just after I took this picture, a helicopter came in sling-loading a 500-gallon bag of water. They're called blivets. They're very thick rubber. They're cylindrical. Uh, they've got an axle so they can roll. And he brought this blivet in and tried to put it down pretty much where the picture's taken from, and he missed. And this blivet went down that hill. Nothing anybody could do but sit back and enjoy the, the scenery as just 500 gallons of water went bouncing down through that area. Boing, 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 bounced over the guns, flattened that house, kept on going, but off the far edge, didn't hurt a soul, and went down to the bottom of the mountain and exploded in the trees. Again, it's only tax money. These are my two main radio operators, Sonny and Zach. I'm in touch with them today. I meet them all the time. Uh, we have a special bond because we're so close together. That's uh, my third platoon leader once we got an officer with Chuck Jesse. And he's wearing, I don't know if you can see it, but he's got a, a Halloween mask, a skull mask, and he's got a little uh, pumpkin that was sent to him by his, his uh, family. And, uh, you know, that was haha, -ha, we enjoyed that. Everybody took their pictures. And then he got put in the bottom of the foxhole and covered over, we moved out. About three weeks later, we, we had to fight for an enemy bunker complex. And inside one of the bunkers in that bunker complex, we found both of those things. So they were following along behind us, digging up our fox holes to see what they could find out. That's Sonny, my, my, my RTOs. Oh, those are on railroad tracks here that hadn't been used for quite a while. And again, I took that to show the, the rucksack. They were probably, I carried the lightest rucksack in the company, I'm sure. Mine was 70 pounds. These guys, he had to carry radio on top of that, plus smoke grenades, all manner of stuff. My dad flew in, and I think his pilots took the prize for how big your eyes can get inside their windshield as they were 
brought down along this railroad track with just about two feet to spare with those rotor blades on either side. And there we are. You can, can you tell which one that was in the infantry? And we used the same railroad track to medevac a wounded guy out of there. The medevac pilots, you notice that this, and I'll just hang it another picture, this medevac has a machine gun. The first Cavalry Division had organic air ambulances. They were called medevac instead of dust off, which everyone else in the country had. And because they were organic to the division, they were armed. Um, it's a unique view of the uh, Geneva Convention where a medic can be armed to protect his patients, not to, not to conduct offensive operations. But our medevacs were armed because the bad guys would shoot at them as well as anybody else. And even though we were marked with the, the cross on the bottom, on the front, on both sides, it didn't stop them from shooting. And I got the greatest respect for these guys in the world. We got in a, uh, a bunker complex fight and one of my platoon leaders was, was shot and very badly wounded. And we called for a medevac. And we used the code of, of urgent, which meant uh, we would appreciate you coming out with all, all haste because we're going to lose life on our eyesight within an hour. And I asked that they put a doctor on board the aircraft. He and I were talking face to face. And a, a bad guy in the trees fired bullet came down over my shoulder, it actually flicked my ear and hit him right on the collarbone and it diverted down and there was no exit and uh, he was messed up and the medics were trying to get him squared away so I called for this medevac, we were in deep jungle, we are having trouble getting smoke up through the jungle because it would dissipate before he got up there. So we had some rather brave guys cutting down trees and tying smoke grenades on the end of these trees and shoving them up through there. And these guys came out. The medevac number was 3-3, I'll never forget it. And he had two Cobra helicopters with him, these are gunships. And he got on my, my company frequency, and I was lying on the ground on my back looking up through the, the trees, and the bunker was right next to me where Bill was inside being treated by the medics. And this the pilot on there was chewing tobacco, and you could hear him talking and spitting while he was communicating with me, and he was the calmest guy in the world. And the, the helicopter, when they talk, is sort of like, like this when they're going because of the vibrations. Like that. And Medivac 3-3 came in, he said, we're on, we're unbound, I got your smoke finally. Uh, I want to drop you a rigid litter, which was a Stokes litter that was just a big steel mesh frame. You could put a guy in it, bolt him into it, and then they would lower a hook, hook him on, yank him out. So we're laying there, and I talked him into getting over me by saying, come left, come right, come left. Still couldn't see him, but I could see the downwash and I could hear him. And when I, I got him over me, I said, okay, there's where you are, put out the litter. And he kicked the litter down and landed pretty close to me. About that time, the bad guys in the trees opened fire on his helicopter. And they were, four or five of them with automatic weapons, and they were shooting the jungle down around me. and I. I started screaming at this guy, should you take a fire, break away. And I wasn't saying it as calmly as I'm talking right now. And he came back to me as calm as you can be, and he said, well, you're a hard guy to find. We're not taking any serious hits right now. So I'll just stay where I am, and you get your guy in that litter, and we'll get him out of here. And about that time, the young medic came crawling out of that bunker. I say kid, he was probably 17 or 18. The new guy, he crawled over to me, and I knew what he was about to tell me. He was about to tell me that, that Bill Thigpen was dead. But he couldn't say it. And he crawled over to me and he said, he's crying. He said, he's, he said, he just couldn't say the word. And I said, son, I was 23, by the way, I was an old man. I said, son, is he dead? He said, yes. In fact, he just nodded his head. So I called him. I said, break off. The guy's the line guys one. To get out of here. And so at that point, he said, OK, I'm sorry. We couldn't, you know, couldn't help him. He broke away. And the two Cobras that were orbiting said, uh, get your people down. We're going to do some work in the treetops for you. And they found 
an opening in the trees about 20, 30 meters away that they could hover down into to get their guns below the level of the treetops. And then they just opened up with their rockets and machine guns. It was above our heads, but coming through, we didn't have any more trouble from the bad guys at that point. But that was very typical of dust off in Medivac. I've never known one to refuse coming in. And I have seen them, as in this case, come in at great risk to themselves. Uh, in my first tour, we had a, a medevac, which are not even armed, come in to get one of my guys in the middle of the night. And he was very leery that he might have been being sucked in by Vietnamese speaking English. Uh, and so I was guiding him in by sound and using a strobe light. And he wanted to convince himself that I was, in fact, a GI. And so just like in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, where they'd ask you who who won the World Series and stuff like that. He was asking me those kind of questions. And I didn't follow baseball. <laughs> Everything he asked me, I said, I don't know. <laughs> and the, bless his heart, he came in. I mean, he had to make a decision that I'm just going to have to trust that, you know, there's a guy on the ground that needs help. And uh, he told me, he said, all right, look, just for you know, and turn on my landing lights. I said, go for it. And he did. And he got our guy out of there. You know, God bless him. Fantastic guy. And they could fly too. Holy cow. This is Sunny on a landing zone, and all of a sudden I heard noise coming from the back. Poppity, poppity, pop. And I turn around, he's got Jiffy Pop. And you see that big grin on his face. He thinks he's. That was the greatest thing in the face of the earth. Somebody sent him some Jiffy Pop. And we used a uh, plastic explosive to heat it. It's, it's C4, which burns very, very. Uh, hotly. And you can take a piece of C4 about the size of your little fingernail, uh, maybe about the size of a pencil eraser, light it on fire, and you can boil a canteen cup of water from it. So these were, these were pretty interesting stuff to hand. And so everybody carried some C4 with them. And of course C4 is expensive as a dick. And uh, so the army said, look, can't use C4 to cook anymore. You got to use these heat tabs, which took you know 28 tabs to make tepid water after three hours. So now that that was no go, and uh, so the army said, "Well, we're not going to be issuing out this uh, C4 for you guys anymore." We said, "Fine," because C4 is the explosive in a Claymore mine. Now we had Claymore mines out the Wazoo, and they were not going to tell us you can't have Claymore mines. So you just open them up. You got a half a pound of C4 in there. Take the mine back with you, throw it in the river. And you got very, very expensive C4. So they finally relented and said, okay, you get C4. This is a rubber plantation. Um, the trees. I took this specifically to obscure the fact that the trees are lined up. You can, you can look down these rows of trees, and you can look at them at angles. But if you look at them just cattywampus, it's a solid wall. And it's pretty dark in there. And the way they collect rubber is they cut all the branches off from about here down, so about the bottom six or eight feet. And they cut a spiral groove around the tree, and they've got a little porcelain bowl in the bottom, and the sap just runs into this bowl, takes forever. Uh, and it's white, and it's sticky. It's not as sticky as maple syrup, but it's sticky. And uh, we got in a couple of gunfights in the rubber plantation. And I got to tell you, you can tell when you've been in a gunfight in a rubber plantation, everybody's covered with white stuff. You have to try to peel off your, off your skin when you get it done. And that's Kentucky <coughs> in a rubber plantation. He shot this guy who was carrying this. RPG. And uh, that was the day when my military prowess really, really shone. Uh, my command group would go with a platoon of maybe 20 guys. And nearly invariably, that platoon would be selected by the battalion commander to be sent someplace else. So we'd have to go to a landing zone. They would go away, and there I would be with my four or five guys. And I would then move to another platoon, and we always got in a gunfight on the way. And I got tired of it, because all the guys at my command post except me were carrying radios. 
uh, or some other piece of equipment. I had me, my two radio operators, the company medic who's carrying a huge medical aid bag, and a rifle. The field first sergeant, the field artillery observer, and his radio operator. And that was it. And this took place on one of those events where we were zipping down through the rubber plantation, following the trail. You can see there's a ditch here. Dishes are on the outside. And uh, we've got new rucksacks that had the quick release tabs on them, where if things got bad, you could just yank these tabs down and the rucksack would fall off, which saved a lot of trouble. And uh, Kentucky was walking on the point. I was on one side of the road. I was walking slack on the other side of the road. And we were staggered around there. And he got up to an intersection. And I saw him stop, back up, throw his rifle, and start shooting across to my side of the road, but farther to the front. And he's screaming, gooks, gooks, gooks. So we all went down in ditches. I was deathly afraid that he was shooting at the platoon we were trying to catch up to. And since we had this new rucksack, I went into that ditch intentionally on my back, yanked those things, and nothing happened. And so you've heard of the post-turtle. That's basically what I was laying upside down like a turtle in a ditch unable to move, 70 pounds are holding me down, and I'm thinking, this is not the way to go. And meanwhile, Kentucky's got a one-man war going on up to the front. And he's throwing hand grenades, and he's shooting, and he's screaming, and I'm yelling at him, are you sure it's the bad guy? Yes. And uh, periodically he would yell, a little help. And I'd say, I'm working on it. And then finally he said, well, at least throw me a hand grenade, because I'm out of grenades. I said, okay, that I can do had hand grenades attached, pulled the hand grenades off, and my rucksack fell off. Because <laughs> I managed to put the spoons of the hand grenades right through the quick release. <laughs> Kidneys. So I got him his hand grenades, he got the guy, and I let him shoot the RPG. And he was very, very pleased. And then he got up in a tree like this guy here and shot six bad guys. One after another, Sergeant York style, as they came peeling around through the through the bushes trying to get around us. This is the kind of jungle we were in. You can notice it's flat. You notice know, a little brown spot right here. That is a former well or a former village that had been excavated by us just prior to this picture. We had come out of the of the jungle and we were going to get picked up by helicopters in here, and as the first group landed, we came out, and the guy right in front of me, I'm walking, we're walking through elephant grass about this tall, and suddenly he disappeared. And it was like in the cartoons. His helmet stayed in the air, and he was gone. And then the helmet went, and I thought, wow. I got down on my hands and knees, and I crawled, and he'd gone down in that well, because you couldn't see it, it had been abandoned for so long. And the grass was sort of matted down by the helicopters, and he just stepped right into that thing. <laughs> 70 pound rucksack, and went down about 20 feet. Bam. So we're hollering down to him, and bless his heart. He said, I'm okay. Please get me out. But in the meantime, throw me a flashlight. I'll look around. Maybe they've got an arms cache down. We had to get a helicopter and a rope out there, drop the rope down to him, haul him out of it. And that's why you can still see the round, round spot there. No damage to the guy at all. Amazing. That's one of my newer RTOs, John Coonrod. I'm also in touch with him. And you can see some of the, the water that he carries here. He's got a one-quart canteen, two-quart canteen, and a five-quart canteen. And that would pretty much get us through three days if you ration your water. You can see that we didn't shave in the field. Uh, I didn't insist that they shave because one, I was lazy, and two, it used water, and three, it's sort of like camouflage, and it kept the mosquitoes uh, away from your skin in some cases. But when we got back to the rear, on those rear cages of the fire base, everybody had to shave, and everybody, of course, first shaved with mutton chunks so they could have their pictures taken in it and shave off the rest of it. This is a case where the engineers had to repel in to blow down some trees so that we could get a landing zone to get food and water, that sort of stuff. And they were pretty good at it. They could bring in the chainsaws. 
I carried the company guide on with me for a while. We put it up at times like this. That's our uh, interpreter, Mom, who is a, uh, a mountain yard. And it was an interesting interpreter because he didn't speak any English. <laughs> and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of interpreting going on. I mean, the sign language. Uh, when I first got over there, we had we stopped for the night on the side of a mountain, and there were these two huge rocks that came together like this. And I thought, boy, it'd be neat to sleep right here, uh, as long as it's not going to rain. So I went to Mom, and we went, it's, it's going to rain tonight. You know, I'm thinking, he's like Tonto. He's going to know this stuff. You know? <laughs> and he says, ah, no rain. Said, okay, good. So we stayed there. We had a toad strangler come through that night, washed us halfway down the mountainside. We had gear everywhere in the world. And that's the last time I listened to this guy. Here's Thanksgiving dinner in the woods. Uh, they made a special effort. You can see that there's uh, wine and an icer, actual turkey. And, uh, and this wood line behind us was a uh, North Vietnamese bunker complex that we had just taken care of. Um, we were on the fire base and we were told that an American Ranger team had found this uh, bunker complex and they were going to keep an eye on it. And my company was to fly in in the morning and attack this place. So we said, okay. We only had six helicopters, so we had to ferry the company in. So my plan was I'd go in with the first bunch. We'd land and secure the wood line. When the second bunch got there, we'd start moving in there and let the rest of the company filter in behind us. Not a really good plan, but what are you going to do? So we hit the ground, the helicopters left, and they didn't come back. And you could hear quite a ways. There had been a wreck on the pickup zone. There was one tree and a helicopter ran right into it. So they were all stopped. So things got an antsy out here, and so I wasn't going to attack into a bunker complex with 20 guys. So we're waiting. And all of a sudden, out of this wood line comes a file of GIs wearing boonie hats and weird camouflage. The guy walking point is carrying a machine gun and a radio. And they just come walking out of there. And I went over to him, and I put my hand on his shoulder. And I, I knew they were the ranger team. And I wanted to know what was going on. And the guy behind him put his rifle up and knocked my hand away. He said, don't you touch my lieutenant. Well, so I said, you're the, you're the team, ranger team leader. And he said, yeah. And I said, what's the story on the bunker complex? So we got tired of waiting. We took care of it. We're on the way out of here. Have a nice day. And they left. We went in there. And there were about 35 or 40 dead guys laying everywhere. The ranger team had decided during the night, let's just do this. And they crept in and caught these guys at breakfast. And they all came out of their hooches and were sitting around tables, and they just hosed them. And all we did was went in there and buried them. And right after we finished burying them, we had Thanksgiving dinner. A good way to build up an appetite. Uh, all that is sweat. I'm a very good sweater, by the way. You can see what an artillery shell does to a railroad train. Close the train down quite a bit. <laughs> and here's a guy being hoisted up in what they call a jungle penetrator, which is a seat that one guy can sit on and they'll yank him right up out through the jungle. So you don't put people on there who were badly wounded because they really can't get on. And this guy, as I recall, had some minor wounds to his legs, and so we just got him out of there as best we could. I like to show this picture a lot because it embarrasses John. Uh, one of my radio operators, John Kundrod, he lives in uh, uh, western Pennsylvania, in uh, Greensburg. If you need to go see him, you can tell him you saw him. <laughs> this, this was on Christmas Day. And uh, there was a truce, and they brought out this little jug here with a shower thing on the bottom and a bunch of water. So guys got to line up and take a shower for the first time. And, many, many days, and John has taken good advantage of that. I'd show a little skin, you know, in my presentations. 
And this was the command post trench. And I show this to give you an idea of how we laid out our holes at night. And we followed a trick that the Viet Cong and the NVA used, which was to dig a position in the shape of a Z. And that allowed them to get away from the rest of the trench. If somebody threw a hand grenade in here, they could have dug around this corner and wait for it to go off, or the hand grenade in here, and they could duck around there. And that's how they were used. They used to put overhead cover on them. But we didn't generally do that because we are only there for one night. This, these are the officers of B Company. That's me. There's a guy with what they say is one French fry short of a uh, Happy Meal, who was a uh, third platoon leader. Bill Thickpen, who was the guy who was killed in the bunker complex. And uh, George Dupuy, who was really bad at that same day and evacuated out of there. You can see how you set up with the disguise guiding in this helicopter with his rifle in the air. Tell him, guide on me. And as the helicopter comes down, he just brings it down and says, set it down. We get about six helicopters at a time. You can see we were the best equipped army in the face of the earth. Notice this guy's pants. And he was like that for probably three days. And that's one of our fire support bases. Uh, and this, this to us was heaven. This had artillery pieces on it, had our mortars on it, uh, no running water, but there was some electricity. Uh, and it's a chance to, to relax a little bit. We'd come back and defend the fire base about once every 20 days or so for about three or four days. And that's on the fire base itself. And that's a flying crane. Uh, and that thing could pick up a bulldozer. And that's what they were used for in the main. They no longer have them on active duty. The last group that was on uh, active duty was in Pennsylvania at the uh, 28th Division down at Fort Indian Town Gap. Yeah, they, they, they're commercially, you know, they do use them in California. This is uh, following one of our memorial services. They still do the same, same sort of thing today in Baghdad and Afghanistan. And that's the chaplain contemplating things after the service. And I just had to throw a picture of a dead guy in here. Now, I, I viewed our enemy as criminals and terrorists. Uh, and I had no respect for them as people, but great respect for them as fighters. As long as they were fighting, I had no concerns for them whatsoever. If they were wounded, and they fell into our custody or they surrendered, it was a whole different story. And I, my belief was treat them in accordance with the Geneva Convention. This guy was, was uh, badly wounded in an ambush. And when I got the call that said he's alive, I grabbed my company medic and I said, let's go. We'll get on down there and see what we can do. And my medic was taking his time getting his stuff together. And I said, come on. And he looked at me and he said, do you really want me to save him? And I said, you bet your ass I do. Because he's now our responsibility. And so we got down there, but he was, he was bad. You can see this, the gunshot, <coughs> gunshot into the abdomen and healed and everything. But at this time in the war, this was at the end, we were burying the dead. Prior to this, we'd left them away. If they got in our way, we'd put them in a net sling them out and just throw them in the jungle. We just didn't care about them. But toward the end of the war, we were required to start burying these guys and marking the graves and and uh, reporting the locations in to higher headquarters. So this guy, we took a special effort to have his head point toward the east. I don't know if that meant anything to them, but I thought somewhere it might. We put a wooden cross over his uh, grave. We put a first cab division shoulder patch on it and put a date. And we covered him up. Notice we had ladies out there. This was a unique fire base. Uh, just a very few guys in one place. And the donut dollies were restricted in how far forward they were allowed to go. But some guys said they can go as far forward as a 
as a fire base. And so we designated this place a fire base, even though it was maybe three times the size of this room. And the whole reason we were there was this, which is the searchlight. And they would shine that straight up in the air at night and put leaflets out saying, come on in and surrender to the searchlight. Well, that worked like nothing. <laughs> but these ladies would come out, they'd talk to the soldiers, they'd play games with them, they'd have a little song fest. Uh, they allowed a GI to see an American woman. And that has much more value than a lot of people can appreciate. And it's something that the nurses uh, need to know too, Army nurses especially. It's not just that they're providing nursing care, they're providing a female being. And that, that is a lot in the recuperative uh, way. And my mom was an Army nurse, so I know these things. That's a Cobra. That's the uh, attack helicopter. They were called Snakes uh, as an acronym, well, not an acronym, as a moniker, because they were Cobras. And this guy, they had a, a chin gun that was controlled. The front seat guy was the, the gunner and the back seat guy was the driver. Air conditioned, by the way, one day night. And the gunner had uh, a sight that stuck out on a rod in front of his helmet and just hung down. And wherever he put that, the gun systems went. So all he had to do was look at his target and push the trigger. And on this side, he's got rocket pods and a, and a minigun, I think. And I think I've got other pictures of it. Yeah. Rocket pods, a, a chain gun, it's a machine cannon. It just fires at an unbelievably high rate. And on the other side, you got two rocket pods and then a minigun up front as well. These guys could really make a mess. Now, I'll relate another story. This little stubby wing that sticks out here is for the purpose of supporting the ammunition. But they tell these pilots that if you have to go rescue somebody, the crew of another airplane, you can pick up four. There are ammunition doors. This is the end of one of them here. The pilot can push a button and that door will fall open. And it's got chains on it to hold it at the horizontal level. And one guy can sit on that, get his hands up inside and hold on. And then one guy on the other side, and then one guy can lie across this and hold on, and you can get them all out of there. Uh, and I talked to a friend of mine who was a snake driver, and I said, you ever do that? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, sometimes I take the airplane back to depot maintenance to get the fingerprints out of it, yeah. <laughs> and that sort of stuff. He said he picked up a guy in, uh, in Cambodia on the ammo door. The guy climbed, and you can see that when that ammo door is down, they're pretty close to this stuff. And it was a hover down and hover back up. And he had these two guys on the ammo doors. And he couldn't get enough pull on the helicopter to get it out of this hole because it still had all the ammunition. He couldn't talk to those guys outside to tell them, hey, bad things are about to happen. Hope you don't fall off. And he just salvoed all of his rockets that came by these guys at about, you know, four inches. And fortunately, they didn't fall off. But they talked to him later. And the ammo doors were no longer serviceable because they all had big creases in the bottom. That's 81 millimeter mortar. We had those in the company. They shot high explosive, or we called it white phosphorus WP. It's also called Wilson Pickett just because that sounded neat to the guys. And this is a good sight to see when you fly in on those things. And we did a movement there, and this is what we landed next to, which filled us with enthusiasm for getting back on those airplanes. It's a caribou. You put about 20 guys on it, I guess. He uh, landed with one wheel off of the perforated steel plate, cartwheeled himself down the runway. And then I got a cake on my birthday, first sergeant flew it out. And in this uh, suitcase here, was a bottle of Lancer's wine on ice. And this was the last day of the field. That's the, then the officers in the company and mom, who wanted to get in his picture. We all turned in our ammunition. The only guy disarmed 
is this guy who is a field artillery forward reserver, and he's got a hand grenade in his hand. Now, you notice he's wearing glasses. They were about that thick. He was an ROTC commission, and they wouldn't let him go in the infantry because his eyes were so bad, so they made him forward observer in the artillery. <laughs> so I nicknamed him Magoo because that's who he reminded me of the cartoon character. And I'm, we're still in touch, and I still call him Magoo, and in fact, he answers to the, to the name. And I am in touch with all of these guys. We have a company level reunion every year. And this was back in the rear, and the last couple of days of what was going on, we were known as Mongoose Bravo. Uh, we were B Company, which is Bravo phonetically. Early in the war, the guys had captured a, mo a live mongoose. Now, mongooses are faster than cobras, and so everybody thought we were really cool guys because we were faster than, than a cobra, <coughs> faster than a mongoose. mongoose. And so they started calling themselves Mongoose Bravo, and they started painting signs. And that moniker stayed with the company the whole time, right up, in, right up until the end. We still refer to ourselves by that name. I don't know what happened to this sign. I'm sad to say I didn't have the, the smarts at that time to take it with me. They probably just threw it in the trash. But over the, uh, over the course of Mongoose Bravo's time in Vietnam, they had 118 guys killed in action. And out of a company authorized strength of about 118. They had two company commanders killed, about four platoon leaders, uh, several NCOs and the rest of the soldiers. And we're tracking down the surviving families of those guys right now. We have a, a project within Mongoose Bravo to find the families, let them know that we haven't forgotten, and to provide a memorial scroll to them at our expense. It doesn't cost much, but we don't want them to pay for anything. And we found about, the families were about half of them. And we continued the search. Let me turn that off and maybe I could talk for a couple of minutes here. I was asked to talk about World War II as well. So I'll try to cover World War II in about three minutes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my dad, really impressed by the infantry soldiers he saw in World War II, and that, that came to me. And so I studied it all my life. I've always been a World War II buff. I'm an avid military collector. Uh, always wanted to be in the infantry. You know, that wasn't a difficult thing to achieve. Uh, growing up during a war, he said, yeah, come on, you know, we'll take care of you. But I got to work with um, one regiment of 45th Infantry Division, the World War II guys, is the 157th Infantry Regiment. They're Colorado National Guard, World War II only. Uh, most of the color, most of the 45th Division came from Oklahoma, and they had this one bastard regiment from uh, Colorado. And so when the division was reactivated for the Korean War, they cut out the Colorado guys, activated another regiment, and those guys went to Korea. I have a German friend late now, a departed German friend, who was also a historian and also a, a pack rat collector. And uh, he and I would go dig around in the mountainsides and follow the paths of the units and that sort of stuff. And he's the guy that got me interested in the mines and that sort of thing, because he could give them to me. His hidden job was explosive ordnance disposal. He had a buddy who was trying to find the GI that, that he had captured in World War II. And so my help was enlisted. And this started all sorts of stuff. Now, this fellow who was trying to find the American, his name was Ethel Allgaier. And he was about 12 years old when the war came through his town of Niederwurzbach in Germany. And there were two bands of the Siegfried Line, one on each side of the town. It was very unusual. Usually the bands went just around the town. But they were sort of in no man's land. And when the German army evacuated the citizens, Zeppel's dad stayed behind because he was the baker. He wanted to bake bread for those Germans who stayed back. And they would stay in the cellar and uh, go up a couple hours a day and cook bread. One day they heard somebody <coughs> scrabbling around upstairs, and the old man thought it was uh, another citizen uh, robbing him. So he sent Zeppel up there to scare him off, a 13-year-old kid. So he goes upstairs, and he goes to the mail room, 
kicks open the door, the idea being to scare this guy. And there's a GI in there. And this GI has got his back to Zeppel. He's looking out the window with his rifle. Bang, the door goes open. Zeppel sees this guy. Zeppel doesn't speak English and doesn't know yet why he yelled, but he said, hands up, in English. So this guy, somebody's got the drop on him. He drops his rifle. And Zeppel figures, OK, he's going to turn around. And in about two nanoseconds, he's going to pick up that rifle, and I'm done. So Zeppel went forward, grabbed the rifle, and gave it to the guy. About that time, artillery came in, so they took him downstairs. And the guy spent the day with him, showed pictures of his family. And the next day, the Americans took the town, and this guy was gone. Well, this was the most historical thing that ever happened to Niederwurzbach, with the exception of overdue library books, which were you know, number two on the list. And so after the war, the, the citizens of Niederwurzbach, and principally Zippel Allgaier, would celebrate this event, 18th of March, 1945, when Zippel Allgaier captured the heavily armed American soldier. And they all created uniforms for themselves, and they would have this huge ceremony. And it got so big that they couldn't fit it in the town. They had to go to the neighboring town to get a big enough place to have this. And there would be speeches. And Zippel would have these ever-increasingly ornate uniforms with shoulder boards out to here, and he would relate the story about he captured this American soldier, and, uh, and he became known as the doctor of American catching because he was so expert at doing this stuff. And they would invite the local Americans to come who could not figure out that this was a big joke on themselves. So they asked me to come down and uh, present an award to Zuppel. So I did. And uh, we manufactured some award. I had a German guy translate it so that what I was reading was accurate. And I gave him an award for performing something only a German could do, which is to obey diametrically at the same time. And that was the Americans saying, do not enter our advance. And the Germans saying, don't let the Americans in. Capturing the American and then turning and loose. He did both. So he's a good guy. But that starts me trying to find this GI. And uh, he never did find the character. But I found out what he was. And then, Reading the units, I came across the 157th fight at the village of Rikersville, and that's how I became interested in those guys. Um, and this was a, a storied unit. And he uh, had 511 days of combat. I began attending their reunions. Uh, I'm now in charge of their reunions. Uh, I've been documenting everything I can. And the regiment had 3,000 guys authorized. And in the course of World War II, I have 18,000 names guys that went through the through the residence. They didn't stay very long. A lot of killed, a lot of wounded, a lot of captured. The World War II GI has always amazed me. Um, just because of what they did. They knew that there were only a very few ways they were going to get out of this. They were going to win the war or they were going to get wounded and evacuated or captured or killed. That was it. And yet, understanding that, they were able to keep on going, persevere, to move out. That was amazing to me. Uh, I think they were just stronger people in those days. I know I respect the hell out of them. I'm sort of, sort of pleased that they allow me to spend some time with them. I'll explain some things here, and then you can look at them, if you will. Pack rat collector, a friend of mine, collects old Bibles. Not antique Bibles, just old ones, beat up Bibles. He buys these for a quarter from uh, old folks' homes sales when people die with no family and they sell their possessions. And he bought this one for a quarter and in it he found a V-mail letter. And he knew that, that I was interested in World War II stuff, so he said, here, you can have this. And I looked at it, and it's an innocuous letter. Uh, just a letter from a, a boy to his mom. So, not much going on. I'm still hanging around. Have a nice day. From a guy named Ardine D. Vernatter, Company B, 506 Parachute Empty Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. To his mom, Mrs. Culler. And I thought, 
why would you keep this one letter? Because it doesn't say anything. And then I saw the date. 23 May 1944. That was the date they started pulling the airborne troops into these cantonments in England to get ready for the invasion of Normandy. And when they brought them into these cantonments, they said, right home now, because after tomorrow, no mail in, no mail out. So everybody was encouraged to write a letter home. And I knew then this was the last letter. And that's why his mother kept it. And so I checked his name against the casualty list, the master who oversees dead World War II. This young man was killed in action on D-Day in Normandy. And there's no one left to remember him. So I did that. On November 11, it's just a day that's easy to remember. I get my little shot glass and I go out on the front porch with an American flag. Stuff like this, and I've got a purple heart for another young man who was killed that has no family left. And I think about it. But I know full well there are millions of others who fall in that same category. This guy here is George Bell, who was killed in the Normandy campaign. His purple heart is there. No family left. The family that, that had this gave it to me, just saying, here, we don't want it. He was a distant uncle. So you do something with it. So I do. I, I keep it on display in my living room. I take it out when I go to my Purple Heart meetings, when we collect money for uh, our hospital courses. Uh, and I put it on display that people can see. This came with regimental history, the division history, uh, a big certificate signed with a factual signature of the president thanking his mother or the sacrifice of her son, uh, the certificate for the award itself. And one of the things I really think is neat was a letter to his mom from the regimental commander after the war forwarding the regimental and division histories, saying, dear man, we'd like you to know what your son helped us to achieve. And those regimental and division histories were not government produced. They were produced by the pocketbooks of the soldiers. And so the regiment fought enough to set aside enough money to provide those things to the families of all their children. That to me is super. That's what being a soldier is all about. I've got a Claymore mine, which we carried, just hooks up on a wire, stick it out, drive it in the ground, run back with a clacker, hence the name. And when the bad guys make noise, you belong into the next county. This thing is got about 5,000 BBs in the front of it here. It's very directional, but it cuts a swath about six feet high to knee level, angle about like that, the closer you are, the worse it can be for you. This is a GI canteen cup I took off the ground at Rikersville, where my regiment fought. You can see that it's probably not preparable. And as I point out to former soldiers, this is what happens when you don't take care of your equipment and the taxpayer has to buy it. This also came off the hill the regiment was fighting in. It's a German helmet. has a nice neat little bullet hole through the front and out the back. If he had it on his head, he probably did not make it. And this was a helmet of the 6th SS Mountain Division. So I get to not even know where the, where the helmet came from. Sadly, there's no insignia left on it. My German buddy helmet the EOD guy provided me with this. This is a spring mine. World War II bouncing Betty. Step on it or pull it, and a black powder charge blows this thing straight up in the air about four feet, and then it explodes, and it's full of basically ball bearings or cut pieces of rebar, and it makes a mess. <coughs> this is one of 6,000 of these things found in a boathouse on the Tsar River about 20 years ago. This is the infamous shoe mine which stood for Schutzenmien, which is a defensive landmine. It's a wooden box inside a quarter pound block of TNT and a fuse. <coughs> because it was wooden, it was very difficult to pick up on a metal detector. It could be picked up because it had a couple nails in it, and there's some metal parts on the fuse. But a minefield is just as effective if the enemy knows it's there as if they walk into it, because the object is to deny an area and canalize them in a different area. And this thing would just take off your foot at about the knee level. <coughs> um, interesting soldier stuff, I think. I found this belt in a, in a flea market. It's a frontier belt, the U.S. Army, when we were shooting. 
cannons at each other. That's the part that didn't cuss her so much good as a little big one. And uh, I was looking at this and I noticed that it didn't any longer expand because it's an adjustable belt. And I started playing with it and I found out why. And that's because the soldier made a little pocket there for his wallet and stood the thing shut. And even though I, I should take it out to make it original, I can't. I think it's just what a neat thing. That's from somebody in the frontier kept his money. And did you know that in World War II, Zippo devoted 100% of his lighter production to the U.S. Armed Forces? You can still find these around every once in a while. Who knows what this is? <laughs> I asked my dad, I said, what the hell is this? He said, well, those are the laces for the leggings. That's exactly what that is. Legging lacings. Uh, have my insect repellent bottles with a mortar fragment in them. They were on the side of the, of the helmet the night I got shot. Yeah, the old German hand grenade. These were like a soup can. They were mostly blast. Uh, they had to look at our grenades, which were fragmentation, and they said, hey, we've put a sleeve over it, so they made a sleeve. And you slide on here and lock it in place, so they had the, the choice of blast or fragment. I've got an AK-47 up here. Uh, I've got an, an M16 lookalike up here. M16 is what we carried, very lightweight. We had a 20-round magazine at the time, and you can just up along the woods, you're, you're more than welcome to pick these things up if they interest you. There's no ammunition for these things up here. <laughs> now, this particular AK was a battlefield pickup of mine. We were shooting at this guy. I didn't do this damage to it, but my machine gunner did. And you can see there's a bullet mark up through here and one up through there. This guy had a lot of attention being paid to him. There were several of us shooting at him, but these these marks are clearly from a machine gun low bullet, not, not my M16. And now, hey, I'm three minutes over time. May I answer questions? Yes, sir. Thank you, Hugh. This is one of my Philadelphia, Philadelphia lawyer uh, family now. Thank you, Hugh. And I really enjoyed that. I could be prouder of you. I have to tell you that your uh, cousin, my experience was when you were at Fort Dix, going out for a second tour of duty. I remember seeing a, uh, I, re I remember seeing a Marlboro cigarette box, a long one, filled with uh, the Ace of Spades. Oh, yeah. Uh, military camouflage. I knew what you were doing was important. And uh, I asked the fatal question uh, as a 13, 12 year old or 13 year old, um, had you killed anyone? Because I didn't know. 13 year old box to know. And, uh, my bottom got a bruising that day yeah, sure. from my dad, but uh, I couldn't be prouder of you. The sacrifice that you've made was, I never saw these pictures before, and I want to thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 did, I did want to ask you, uh, could you, uh, if I understood you correctly, uh, there was a rear position, a, fi a fire station or a fire position, and the jungle. Yeah. Um, can you explain uh, how long did you, you said you went to the rear position twice in a yeah. year? Yeah. Uh, can, could you explain how long were your tours in the jungle? Could you also, uh, this is a three-part question, could you also mention your defensive positions at night? And finally, could you explain, uh, I understand how proud you are of our World War II vets, and I am equally. Could you explain the common thread and the differences between the World War II infantrymen, the Vietnam infantrymen, and Iraq's infantrymen? Sure. That's the easiest part of the question, right there. Basically, there is no difference. Uh, the guy in the infantry learns pretty quickly the first time he gets missed by a gunshot what it's all about. And it doesn't matter what you do, it's the fact that you were there that matters. And there's a, a bonding of soldiers. There's a, a closeness because what you do and are expected to do that requires a huge amount of reliability and responsibility. When you turn to somebody and you say, cover me while I move, or watch my back while I go in this building, you gotta know that that guy's gonna do that. 
and you have to know instinctively, you know, say, okay, can you do that for me? And so you get this, this closeness that, that lasts forever. The GI World War II, the GI of Vietnam, and the GI today are the same guy. A little older. Uh, in Vietnam, we were a little bit older than the World War II guys, I think. Now they're even a little bit older than, than we were. Uh, but the guy that goes out the front door of the landing craft and the guy that jumps out the helicopter is the same, same guy. He sucks it up and does what he has to do. They say the American's old no weapon still walks on his hind feet and needs a that's, that's pretty much true. We were echelon in Vietnam with far rear, central, and front. Although there weren't any front. I mean, there were bad guys everywhere. It just depended on where your capabilities rested. The far rear, they had electric lights. They had, some of them had flush toilets. Um, that, was, that was heaven back there. They had ice cream factories. We never saw that in, in infantry except for twice. Um, the fire support bases were where we thought with Mecca, and that was a place where artillery was. And they had a chance to get a field shower, a chance to get some hot food. Um, you could get some sleep. Because one of the things about a soldier in the field is he's just always tired, he's, he's exhausted. You never get any good sleep. Um, and those places were, you, you, you could have lights, you could sit up write a letter, uh, you can walk around without having to have your bomb hat on all the time. Uh, they did get attacked periodically, but you weren't as, uh, as vulnerable as you were in the forward areas. In the forward area, you were out there with, in the mud and the blood and the beer. And we basically spent our time trying to find a bunch of bad guys that did not want to get found. And when we found them, they wanted to get the hell out of it. And my first tour, which was in 68 and 69, early 69, we had a war game. And we would fight people. And uh, there were some exciting levels going on. My second tour, they were running from us. And whenever we could find them, we'd pile on. They didn't have a chance. Uh, and we stayed out in the woods for about 20 days, 21 days. There were four rifle companies. And one of them always stayed on the fire base to defend it and get some rest. And so that tells you how the others rotated in and out. But they, sometimes they'd fly us in, sometimes they'd walk us in. Uh, sometimes they had us operating out beyond artillery range, which was always kind of hairy because we love artillery. And they had to shoot 155 for us. And uh, you're talking about a 200 pound projectile full of uh, big booms. And you want to make sure that lands in the right place, not in a bad place. So you need to know where you are and have confidence in those guys. We did have every confidence in them. Artillery guys were squared away. Still are. They're smart. Your defensive positions at night? At night? Uh, I learned so much my first tour, because I was just a green guy, that I applied it my second tour, and I saved lives. We dug in at night. If it was humanly possible, we'd dig a hole, and that's where the guys would stay. I tried to have three men to a position so that they could get some sleep. But you had to have one guy awake at all times. Uh, the Army doctrine says you put out a listening post in the daytime, which is, say, 100 meters forward of your positions, and then you, I mean, an observation post, and at night you change that to a listening post. I didn't want anybody out there at night. So I didn't do a listening post. Darkness came, we were all inside the perimeter, in our holes, and anything out there was fair game. And anything moved, we just killed it. We didn't have to worry about, could that be my LP trying to come back in, and that sort of stuff. Uh, sometimes we couldn't dig in because the ground was too hard, or it was too dark, and we, we didn't want to make a big racket. I made, them, made the guys carry little saws to saw down trees rather than knock them down with an ax or a machete, because it made too much noise. Because what we do is you take a, a sampling about that big around, about this tall, cut it down and then tie it between two trees and break two ponchos over it to make a little tent. And that whole thing would be about this high. And the two guys off duty would could sleep in there and stay out of the rain while the other guy was in the in the foxhole up front. And then it, they were within reach. So that's how you woke each other up and grab his foot. Shake. Uh, I tried to, to, to 
could get guys as much sleep as they could because it was just impossible. You can imagine, you work all day, you're up before dawn, humping heavy, heavy rucks action, you sit in at night, you're going to dig foxholes, got to clear a field of fire, put out your clean one line, get something to eat, and it's dark. Now you got to be on 30% guard all night long. Uh, I feel sorry for them. But that, just, that was just it, that's what you did. Uh, and to answer your question at this point, yes, I did kill people. It doesn't bother me. Uh, my PTSD doesn't have to do with what happened to the enemy. It has to do with what happened to my guys. That, it bothers me that we lost guys. And that guys were, guys were killed doing what I told them to do. Uh, guys that, that chose not to go to Canada. Guys who said, it's my obligation, I'll do it. I don't know anybody who over there who wanted to be there, per se, except for me. But they did it. And Bill Thigpen, when, when he was killed talking to me face to face, uh, that still bothered me. Um, he didn't want to be there. He was not a professional soldier. He was married. He had a young daughter he'd never seen. Um, I was on my second tour. I was unmarried. I was one of three kids in a family, military family. My parents could have dealt with me being killed rather than Bill. And I knew then, I still think now, God took the wrong guy. Uh, but that's just how it works. You can't, you can't try to rationalize it. That, that didn't work at all. I've talked to his widow. Uh, they, they've tried to release me. His family tried to release me from, from all the survivor guilt and stuff, but uh, some is still there. I'll take a little pill now so I can talk like this before I could. Yes, sir. Did you ever wonder what happened to the civilian population that had volunteered or worked with the U.S. Army? Yes. I was, I was very distressed to learn that one of the things that we had left over there was our agent list. Our list of the people, the South Vietnamese, who worked for us. They just got left behind, you know. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, I know that, that thousands of them were in prison and probably equally thousands of them were killed. Hey, i tell you one example. You sure may. Fifteen years ago, roughly, I was in Dallas, Texas. My son lives there. And we were at Mother's Day at a restaurant. And so I walked in with my wife and this young lady, I say young, she was pretty younger than me, Asian, sat next to me. And I introduced myself and asked her name. She said, Trang. I said, Trang? She said, yeah. So we're eating, I'm talking to her, and I says, uh, you new in this country? Well, speak was very, very little. She says, yes, I've been here three years. I said, oh. I said, where are you from? Vietnam. Oh. I says, how come you come to this country? Because we're not exactly invited there or wanted there. I said, what do you mean? Her husband worked for the U.S. Army. I can never get out of her during the conversation what he did. I presume he was a guide or something. Anyway, at the end of the war, they tried to get her a boat to come back to America. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough people on it, or not enough passengers to get on it. Yeah. And they lived some 20 miles from Saigon. The neighbors turned him in. You know, they read it. He was set his way. It took five years daily going to the local police department to find out if her husband was still alive. After five years, they said yes. After another year, they finally told her where he was, some 40 miles away. She got on her bike, and she went there. And she saw him, she couldn't believe him. She said, I could put my two hands around his waist. So she knew he was starving to death. So she asked the guard if she could bring food. Oh no, you can't. He said, but I could turn my back, and you can give me some money. If they asked me if I saw him taking food, I'll say no, because I didn't. And that's what she did. She had three daughters, and she, she told me what she made. And she drove every so often to Saigon, 20 miles away, sold her trinkets, whatever it was, to survive. Of course, no pension, no nothing. Oh, yeah. Don't forget now. Well, she finally uh, got to see him again, and she paid the guard off, and she bought him soup. And she fed him. He was so he couldn't even eat. He served a total of 13 years before he let go. They were not welcome back in the village. And somehow, now they made her, 
she told me what country, whatever country was next to Vietnam, she went there, and from there they worked, and then he got to a place, they come to San Francisco, and he settled in Dallas, Texas. Probably Thailand. I said, I said, where's your husband now? She says, he's very, very shy. He's work, he's got a job as a school janitor. Now, she looked good, I'll be honest with you. I mean, she came out with good. No regrets, nothing. She, I said, how do you like Americans? I love America. They're so good to us. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I know you associate, I don't know if you were in Calvary or you associate, associated with Calvary. Yes. Uh, the movie and the book, We Were Soldiers. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Uh, I, I like the, I liked the book. The movie showed half the story. Yeah. Because uh, they didn't talk about the problem, which was the bigger, actually, the bigger battle. Um, I think they did pretty well with that. Uh, it's really hard to do an effective combat scene because it's hard to put the fear into it. Uh, and it's hard to put in what I missed on most of them is tracers. And we all use tracers and those things are sailing through the air right and left. They just uh, illuminated bullets, basically, as they went through. Uh, but I thought they did, they did well with the, with the uniforms, with the, the support they got from the Army and uh, the storyline. I didn't know, for instance, until I read the book that we were still using telegrams to notify the families of the KIA, the first part of Vietnam. Later, later on, it was always personal notification. Uh, the, the photograph on the book, you know who that is? His name is Hal Moore. Moore. I think it's no, no, it's not Hal Moore. No. That's, that's uh, the lieutenant. I forget his name. It was, they did a couple specials on him. Was after oh, he's the guy who died in the World Trade Center? Yeah. yeah. Right. Or a school or something like that? A school. Yeah. Great school. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir? Uh, it's interesting. You confirmed something my right. brother on that said that the movie knew when they bring the helicopters When they bring the helicopters in, you said they hover. Yeah. In the movies, they land. Yeah. And that's yeah. a big difference. There, there were times when they, they put a job while they were hovering. And, Sometimes you just couldn't land. That was one comment from the movie when they when they flew the helicopters down. I've never seen a helicopter fly like that. They flew like this. <laughs> the helicopters don't do that. They, they settle down this way. Um, he said they jumped or rappelled out. They oh, never, yeah. never landed. We would it, it would depend on the on the drivers as to whether they thought they'd get on the ground. But our our mission was to get off the helicopters in less than six seconds. And we didn't wear seat belts. Didn't have doors on them. We we're six guys to get off. Three on each side. And the minute that you get touched the ground, you were getting off. And upstairs, the colonel was counting one thousand, two thousand, three. Uh, and if they couldn't go, I've been in a number of landing zones where there were tree stumps, but this small. The helicopters were worried about catching their, their uh, skids and that stuff. So they'd hover down at 10, 12 feet, and the pilot would turn around and say, "Get out." We throw throw our rucksacks out and then drop down a hank from the skid and let it go. I went out once in the water that I thought was this deep, and it was that deep. And so I kept on going into a sort of a squat with this rucksack on, and I could look up through the water and <laughs> see the helicopter up there. And I barely got my you know, the water, took a real deep breath, and, and the helicopter was rocking like this, and it put the skid on my shoulder and shoved me back down underwater. I thought that was the end. But it's a hell of a thing for a cavalry soldier to die by drowning. Yes, sir. Another one of my Philadelphia attorneys. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank it. Yeah. I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, contributions to people that have been in the service and stuff. Yeah. Your time and your graciousness and everything else. I think that's very important. I'd also like to just suggest that my service was a little bit different. I'm sorry if. Uh, I have to be a Navy man in here, but... <laughs> yeah, we all like the Navy. Uh, <clears throat> I graduated from uh, high school right into uh, the Naval Academy at Annapolis, which, thank you folks, you all paid for. What your relatives did. Just tax money. Yeah. And uh, Not real money. when I graduated, I, gra I graduated into the World War, and I had seen so many things like you have shown on the picture, and 
frankly, I'm chicken. I didn't want to come back a, uh, an amputee or anything else. The mortality rate in the Marines, is, my recollection, was 13%. The Army was somewhere around uh, 10 or 11. The mortality rate in submarines, 22%. I volunteered for submarines because I didn't want to come back an amputee. When you come back, you're either, if you're alive, yeah. or you're dead, and there's no service or anything else. Well, I thought I would, I would mention about Marines, since we're in the topic here. Uh, I was talking to a guy the other day who was assigned down to the Marine Barracks in Washington. And he said they had a director's meeting at the Marine Corps Officers Club down there. And one of the guys uh, said that he'd just been down to the U.S. Army Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia. And he'd seen that in the main part of the Officers Club down there, they had this enormous chandelier. He said, we don't have one here at the Marine Oak Club. And that really sets off the place. It really looks nice. It turns it into a first-class facility. I think we ought to get a chandelier. And they started talking about this. And one guy said, well, how much do these things cost? He said, they're all different prices. Why don't we just set aside like $5,000 and we'll get one? And one of the other guys says, we're Marines. We'll go $10,000. Let's outshow these guys. And they're all talking at $15,000. And finally, the commandant of the Marine Corps is there. He says, hold it. Before we get too carried away with this, I think maybe we ought to find out if we got anybody knows how to play one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What do you attribute to the World War II combat veteran as compared to Vietnam? Because I do not remember anybody getting medical assistance or what we would call battle fatigue right. or shell shock or whatever. That's right. And they are doing since Vietnam and Korea and now Afghanistan and Iraq. Well, I, there are, are World War II vets who are now being treated for that, but most of them are not. It just came too late for them. It was a huge stigma. Uh, I, for one, didn't believe in it. I, I believed in mental difficulties from combat, but not what the classic PTSD was. And what broke the ground for me was the movie Saving Private Ryan. That is the best example and explanation of PTSD that you can get. And that is, earn it. You know, when, when something happens to somebody else and you're there and it could have been you, the rest of your life now needs to be spent justifying the fact that you weren't killed. You've got to live your life to make it worthwhile to have survived. Um, that's a hell of a thing. And that's why the guy was begging his wife at the end. He said, tell me I've been a good man. Because only someone other than yourself can tell you that. Can, can tell you that yes, it was worthwhile that you lived. I thank you for that comment. Because I was in combat for quite a long time as a BAR infantryman. That's what I understand. And that has always been on my mind. I went to visit a supply sergeant, and he had difficulty adjusting to civilian life. Yeah. And so I'm glad everything is happening even today. Yeah. Thank you. Some, some guys, they, they just overload with meds. I'll see some people in my reunions that look like zombies. But what the VA does now is they give you enough to start with, and then they back it off. But you got to know to back it off. In my case, I take a really small amount of basically Paxil. I take 20 milligrams a day, and that puts me back in control of my emotions. Two years ago, I couldn't have given this talk. I'd just be up here just crying on the baby. There are guys who get 400 milligrams. Um, yeah, there's troubled, troubled people out there. Uh, but they should know that help is a bit. Yes, sir. During the Vietnam War, I worked a fisherman porter, and two young men came in to discharge from the Army. Now, this is a story they told me, and that's why I'm going to ask you to collaborate whether it's true or false. They were on the, I think it's called Delta River, mm -hmm. and when they go on it, 
The left was the rubber plantations owned by U.S. corporations. To the right was the jungle. If they got fire from the left on the column here, they would haul ass out of there. If they were fired from the right, then it would turn around and start firing back in again. Now, what can you add about that's, that? That's, that's believable early on in the war. It wasn't a U.S. corporation. Michelin rubber plantations were all over Vietnam. And, and uh, the, the VC took hush money from them. They gave uh, back to these guys. They were areas you didn't go into for quite a while. Uh, and it was troubling when you guys would get shot at and you could return fire in, in those areas. Uh, they were called no fire zones. That went out of business by about 1968, and we went wherever we needed to go. Um, but there were other, other things, like when we went into Saigon, we weren't allowed to use artillery. They were afraid of hurting the town. And so you tell the guys go in there and clean out the bed, guys, but you can't shoot mortars, you can't use artillery, you can't use gunships, and guys were getting killed. And Finally, they opened those gates, <laughs> and when they did, we just went nuts. We went overboard because we denied it so much, and so what they hoped wouldn't happen is what happened. We just flattened the place. I wrote a billion dollars in my life. Yeah. Of course, it's tax money, too, not my money. Any other questions? Do you have a question, man? No, I just well, thank you. It was lovely to hear somebody speaking off the cuff. Yeah. Well, Appreciate it. You don't know if any of them are screaming. Yes, sir. Is your father the CEO of the Thunderbirds? No. Uh, I had no family relationship to it at all. My dad was a signal officer. Uh, so he was never really in the division except early on in World War II in the 4th Division. Have a good day. Um, I just stumbled into these guys and they found somebody that works cheap, free. And uh, so I do their reunions now and I just enjoy being with these guys. Uh, having a great time and I'm able to answer a lot of their questions. I, I do a lot of volunteer work, mostly with World War II veterans, getting their records straight. A lot of them, when they get out of the Army, they just want out. They came back into World War II. And the personnel guys are saying, well, it'll take a couple of days when you get done. No, I want to go home. 